let's get started so we will continue our discussion on least squares problem and if you remember the problem is to minimize x in rn half of norm of gx square which is the same as summation i equals 1 to n gix square Okay, any g i, each g i is a function from R n to R. So, uh, we studied one algorithm for that which was Gauss-Newton's method and the Gauss-Newton method said xk plus 1 equals xk minus alpha k ok this was what we uh, derived where we dropped a few terms from the second derivative of g, uh, not the second derivative of g, but second derivative of norm of g square. So what I want to do today uh, in the first half of the lecture, I will talk about a few examples of this class of problems uh, because those examples are really important. That really tells you why problems of this type, in fact, in, in why problems related to optimization are very crucial for today's world. So the first is curve fitting, okay, and the idea is as follows. You know that z is a variable that is a function of some parameter. and some variables y, okay. To give you an example, the fuel consumption of a vehicle is a function of some parameters which could be the mass and the efficiency of the engine and so forth and uh, y could be the velocity of the vehicle or acceleration of the vehicle and so on, right. You, there are many other cases also where uh, you want to have, there are some parameters and the output depends on some input variables and the inherent parameters that are unknown. Even though you know the function h, okay, you might know the function h because of the physical properties of the system. But what you don't know is parameters. You don't know what the efficiency of the engine is. You don't know what the efficiency of a torque converter is. You don't know what the efficiency of the gearbox is, right? Or you don't know what the efficiency of a battery pack is. So there are some un underlying unknown quantities and the input output relationship of the system depends on those underlying quantities, okay? So what you do? You do an experiment, you run an experiment and you collect yi, zi, i equals 1 to n, right? So you have collected megabytes of data or maybe terabytes of data about the system and now someone asks you, can you find the parameters for the system? We know the physics of the model, so we know what h of x, y looks like but we don't know what the x, what the quantity x is. So how would you set up this problem? How would you set up this problem so that you can find these unknown parameters? Any thoughts? Maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, 
you know maximum likelihood estimation you do that when there is some uncertainty in the system in this system there is no uncertainty whatsoever i haven't added some noise to the system any other thoughts okay you want to define an error function error as a function of x what would that be z i minus h x y i let's square it and let's sum it right that defines an error function so the other thing you can do is also normalize it 1 over n okay so if x was your parameter this is the total error in the output that you see and the input that you see and the model that you have in hand right and what you do is you run this least square algorithm on this particular error function and you want to do is minimize half of error x for x in rn okay assuming that there are n parameters assuming that there are n parameters that are unknown okay so this is my gi of x okay so this is known as curve fitting a very special class of curve fitting uh problems is quite famous nowadays what is it neural network how many of you know neural network okay a few people okay so very special class of curve fitting where h has a very specific form so h so where x is so let me talk about neural network i mean i'm of course uh, doing a gross simplif simplification of neural networks but the idea is fairly similar you have a network where x is r n cross m y is in r m and this is typically high dimensional and your g is in r r this is low dimensional and your h is tan hyperbolic of x y uh, let me write x as capital x because it's a matrix okay it's a matrix in in the case of neural network okay you have tan hyperbolic or in general you have some other sigmoid function sigma of x comma y uh, sorry x multiplied by y x remember x is a matrix y is a vector here and the way i am defining tan hyperbolic of a vector or sigma of a of a vector is sigma of a vector v is sigma of v1 sigma of vn or vm where sigma of a is 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus a okay a is an r so i'm use i'm abusing the notation a little bit i'm using sigma to denote a function over a scalar quantity and then i'm using the same sigma to denote a function over a vector quantity but i guess you there's no there's no uh, loss in understanding in going from here to here because it's the same function that i'm using for all the values in that vector
Okay. So in this neural network, of course, there is a Z should be in R n because X is a vector, uh, X is a matrix of dimension n cross m. Okay, so this is a single layer neural network. It's not very important. Uh, the most important class of neural networks have at least three or four layers, or even more, ten layers, right? But uh, but neural network is also doing some sort of curve fitting and finding an unknown parameter x through some learning algorithm that we may cover towards the end of the course. When we talk about dynamic decision problem or dynamic optimization problem, then we will cover the back propagation algorithm that is used to uh, train neural network. But this is the main idea in neural networks too. You are essentially trying to do a curve fitting which maps a high dimensional space to a very low dimensional space. Okay, and when I say high dimensional, what's the dimension of this? Y. What's the dimension of Y when I say high dimensional here? Anyone knows or wants to guess? No? Millions? Yeah, it's about a million dimensional. Uh, sometimes it's millions, sometimes it's less than a million, maybe a hundred thousand, maybe ten thousand. But that's the dimension that I'm talking about. Re remember, even though you might think that a million data points is a lot. I mean, it's a high, it's very high dimension. If you have a picture that's a thousand pixel cross thousand pixel, you have a million data points right there, right? So just a picture which is thousand cross thousand. Every of most of your photographs would already be higher than this resolution. Okay, so you already have a lot more than one million uh, one million dimensional uh, data points in your pocket. Right, so so that's uh, the high dimensional, and z, the low dimensional part, would be about 300 or 100 or 200 or maybe even 50, 60 dimensional uh, object. Okay, so you see why this least square problem is important, right? Let's do another example. Any question on this curve fitting? No. No, it doesn't matter. We are talking about nonlinear optimization. So it could be non convex. It doesn't matter. In this case, it's always, in this case, it is non convex. It's in fact highly non convex. The other very important class of problems, uh, least square problem, is. Again, system identification, which is very similar to curve fitting. And the idea is I have a dynamic system which satisfies this relationship Okay, and this is the input, and this is the output. Those of you who have taken signals and systems would recognize this uh, this kind of equation, right? It's a discrete time. Uh, what is it called? Discrete time linear system, right? This is a discrete time.
and it's called a difference equation. The continuous uh, time counterpart is a differential equation, right? And that's called continuous time linear system. So this is a discrete time linear system, and this is known as a difference equation. How many of you have taken 3050 here in OSU? You've seen this equation? <laughs> OK, the nodding has to be more uh, emphatic, OK? Like this, yes, I've seen it, OK? <laughs> so now you have a linear system, OK? And you can measure the input, you can measure the output, but you don't know what these parameters are, OK? So you've been asked to identify that parameter. So to give you the most, the, the simplest equation, V equals Ri, we are in electrical engineering, so everybody should know this equation. Oh, maybe some people from civil engineering is they are also taking this course. Okay, maybe you are excused from knowing this equation, but V equals Ri, right? B is the voltage, potential difference across a resistor, you can measure it. I is the current going through the resistor, you can measure it. R is the resistance that you have to measure. Okay, you don't know what the resistance of whatever resistor I've given you. Already. So that's the simplest form of uh, uh, system identification problem where you have to figure out what the resistance is. So I'm going to define my X as alpha one, alpha n, no, alpha zero, and then beta zero to beta n, okay? And what do we want to minimize? What is my error function here? Error as a function of x. This is x transpose z and minus z uh, n n minus zero. No. k minus 0 to k minus n and minus y k minus 0 to k minus n norm square one over n summation k equals one to capital n. Okay. Oh, so this is this matrix is a vector ZK Yeah, ZK ZK minus 1 ZK minus 2 ZK minus N and YK yk minus 1, yk minus n. <coughs> Any question? Oh, minus, yes. Thank you. Okay, again, system identification is a very, very uh, important field, uh, similar to curve fitting, uh, used widely in engineering system, especially in dynamic systems. Okay, you want to measure some unknown quantities, you want to minimize this error. Uh, by finding an appropriate value of x, which essentially is all the parameters of the system. Okay, any question on system identification problem? Okay. So 
those are the two very important class of problems that can be cast as least squares problems. So you should definitely know how to apply least squares because those of you who will be taking up engineering jobs after this will be using this, these methods more often than any other method in optimization. Okay. So let's look at some variants of Le this Gauss-Newton method. Uh, any questions so far on this? No questions? So now I want to consider the case where this matrix is not exactly positive. Uh, no, it is positive semi-definite, uh, but it's uh, not positive definite. So it's v it has an eigenvalue that is very close to zero. Okay. So what happens when you are inverting a matrix that has an eigenvalue very close to zero? Anyone has done that before? Inverting a matrix with eigenvalues close to zero? It's a very bad experience. <laughs> what is the inverse of this matrix? Right, this matrix is not invertible. But let's say, for the sake of argument that this matrix is strictly positive definite. I've picked an epsilon, let's say 10 raised to minus 16. 10 raised to, let, let me just keep it one. What's the inverse of this? 10 raised to 16, 0, 0, 1, okay? Not a happy ending <laughs> for inverting this matrix. So if you have matrix that looks something like this, here, then you are in trouble, right? So there is an option for you, it's called Levenberg Marquardt method, where what you do is xk plus 1 equals xk minus alpha k, and I'm going to add a positive definite term here. Okay, so this is known as levenberg marquardt method where you add a positive, small positive definite matrix in order to make this entire thing uh, positive definite. Uh, and one option is to use a small positive number multiplied by identity, identity matrix. Okay, so that's basically will, uh, will, will work fine for this class of least square problem. Can someone tell me what are you doing by adding this positive definite term here? What exactly are you doing for the f to, to the function, the function that you have, that you are trying to minimize? Yes. So you are increasing the curvature of the function around xk by adding a positive definite term here. So your original function probably looked something like this. Okay, so on one side the curvature is quite high, on the other side the curvature is quite low. So what you are doing is increasing the curvature of the function along this, this direction also. Okay, by adding this positive definite term. And then you are trying to minimize it, so you move from here to here, and then from here to here, and so on. Right? You, because you keep moving this curvature along the optimal, uh, in the direction of the optimal solution. So that's the geometric picture. You're, you're changing the curvature 
of the entire system along certain direction by adding that positive definite term. So that helps you convert. Okay, you you get around with these uh, issues where the gradient of g at x k, uh, the gradient of g at x k along certain directions become very small. Any question on that? No. Then there is another variant of uh, this class of problem known as incremental gradient method where n is very very large okay so you have collected lots of transaction data of your customer customers and now you want to do some machine learning task on that kind of uh, uh, on that kind of data so this is very similar to batch processing how many of you have heard of the word batch processing how many of you have heard the term batch processing before no one no one worked in industry Okay, so batch processing is used when your number of samples, data samples that you have is very, very large. So what do you do? Uh, first of all, you get rid of this inversion because inversion is too difficult. And you have two iterations. One is the iteration xk and the second part is iteration over psi, so psi zero is defined at x k and psi i is defined at psi i minus one minus alpha k gradient of g i psi i minus one Okay, where you your g i is a function from r n to r m and m is much much smaller than n. Oh, and then uh, after you have x k plus one equals psi l. Okay, so you have your outer iterations is indexed by x k, and your inner iterations are indexed by psi i, and psi i goes from psi zero, so i goes from zero all the way to l, where l is some natural number. Question? Sorry? This one? This this one? So so I created a batch GI, so I picked a few of those error terms, so not all the errors together. I didn't stack all the errors together. Okay, I stacked the few errors together, right, which is not as big as of size M. And then I started with XK. I ran the iterations with g i and this is a, just a gradient descent, it's not, it's not that method, just gradient descent, I ran that and then I returned x k plus 1 as psi l and now x k plus 1 will be run at a different g i, not the same g i, okay. So to give you an example, suppose you have the system identification problem y i yeah y i and z i not system identification but curve fitting problem 
i equals 1 to n and n is very very large so i define my g1 of x as summation i equals 1 to m z i minus h x y i square and then I define g 2 of x equals summation i equals m plus 1 to 2 m z i minus h x y i square and so on right. So, I keep changing this index okay and I run this iteration with uh, this is i here. Uh, I mean you do not have to have i here, I can put anything else. What should I index j? Okay, let me put another index j. So, I pick one of these functions, let us say I started with g2. I have some x0 to begin with, I assign psi0 to be equal to that x0 and then I did gradient descent to minimize g2. Okay. In and then once psi l, when once I have computed psi l, I rename it as x1, okay, and then x1 gets renamed to psi 0, and now I start doing gradient descent for g1. So now I am minimizing g1, okay, and then I'll start minimizing g3, and then I'll start minimizing g20, and so on, okay. And why is that? Because remember, this matrix gradient of g would become very high dimensional if n was very very large. So, my gradient of g at x is a vector in n cross capital N. Okay. So, instead of multiplying two matrices with very large number of entries, you essentially divide the problem into smaller problems, smaller chunks and then you execute that optimization problem in smaller chunks. Is that clear? Yes. J is, uh, so you pick, I want to have separate ind indices for psi and g, okay. You can have any, any g here, okay. So, I pick g, 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 z, no, g, j here for this particular gradient descent algorithm. Within this inner, this is an inner loop, this is an inner Sorry? Right, yeah, inner loop, outer loop situation. So, this is the inner loop. I pick a gj and then I start uh, optimizing uh, my x based on gj. So, I am trying to minimize gj here and then I go through the outer loop and then in the next inner loop, I change the gj, I change the function that, that I was optimizing. And I keep passing through the data over and over again, over and over again, and in the end, I will be able to, I mean, it will converge and you will get to an optimal solution or close to an optimal solution eventually, okay. Any other question? Uh, that is a good point. How is it related to stochastic gradient descent? I have not yet talked about stochastic gradient descent, but it is very similar. Yeah, you have mini batch stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so it's similar to that. Okay, any other question? Yeah, you can do that also. Uh, you are right. In general, it is randomized. But I have to just give an example here which is non-random because this is mostly deterministic class. Okay, but yes, you can randomize the indices that you want to put here for defining G, G1 and G2 and G3 and G4 and so on. Okay, so the stochastic gradient descent that he mentioned or batch stochastic gradient descent, all of that uses those ideas of randomization. In fact, uh, what I would say is the convergence of randomized algorithms is a difficult problem to solve, 
okay so that's why people tend to use deterministic algorithms at least people tend to teach deterministic algorithms because it's much easier to prove things uh, for randomized it's very difficult to prove things okay whether they will converge or they will converge to optimal or how suboptimal the solution is and so on okay it's a good phd problem though to analyze randomized algorithms it's really amazing you have to learn a lot to prove convergence for those class of algorithms okay any other question on least squares or incremental gradient method no questions <clears throat> so next topic is conjugate direction methods and here is the idea i want to minimize half x transpose qx minus b transpose x x is in rn what's the big deal here what's the solution to this optimization problem what is x star q is positive definite okay q is positive definite and b is a vector in rn q inverse time b all of you agree with this solution right this is a convex optimization problem so first order necessary condition is also sufficient so you have q of x minus b equal to 0 that's the f o n c and that means x star equal to q inverse b hence prove okay so x star is q inverse of b why would we want to solve an optimization problem if we could solve it this way what's the catch here q inverse is difficult to calculate right so you, you might have a matrix that very very large okay 1000 cross 1000 dimensional or maybe 10000 cross 10000 dimensional okay and you don't want to compute the inverse of that matrix so you want to come up with an iterative method for computing x star the other reason could be that you don't even want to find x star you are happy with an approximately optimal or approximately uh optimal solution which is close to x star in some sense okay so those are the cases where you apply conjugate direction method okay so let's go over what that method does so i define i have d not dn q conjugate vectors and now dn minus 1 okay you know how to compute q conjugate vectors right all of you have done the assignment uh it's the second problem in your assignment 1 so you have these n q conjugate vectors you define you you pick your x not arbitrarily and then your x k plus 1 is x k minus alpha k d k and alpha k is r min alpha greater than 0 f of x k minus alpha d k
let me put it plus, put a plus here. Okay, and as you can see, dk is not related to the derivative of this function, so this is a non-gradient method. So let's uh, so what should the value of alpha k be? So alpha k should satisfy Okay, so this is, remember f is convex in xk, so f is also convex in alpha, right? Once you fix xk and dk, f is convex in alpha. So what is this going to be? dk transpose gradient of f at xk plus alpha k dk equal to 0. So that's the derivative of f with respect to alpha. I should have the correct way to write it as is this way. Okay, all of you understand this this part, this equation. Okay, so that is dk transpose qxk plus alpha k. U D K minus B. What this yields is alpha k equals dk transpose b minus q xk over dk transpose q dk. Okay, so we get alpha k in closed form here. Any questions so far? So what's the idea? I have a convex cost, quadratic cost. I want to solve this optimization problem. So I come up with n q conjugate vectors. And at every point of time, I am optimizing along different directions, right? All of these are q conjugate vectors, but they are all in different directions. So every time I'm optimizing, or I'm taking a step towards one of these q conjugate vectors, uh, actually I, you know, alpha should be in R, not greater than zero. Here, make the correction argmin alpha in R. Okay, so 
every time I am taking a step in one of these q conjugate vector direction, okay, and the claim is x n minus 1 is equal to x star, okay. So, in n steps you convert to the optimal point. That is the claim, it is proved in the book and the sub claim is the sub claim is you define a manifold m k as x naught plus d such that d equals summation lambda i d i i equals 1 to k minus 1 is it k minus 1 or i equals 0 to k minus 1. Okay and the claim is x k equals argument of x in r x in m k f of x. So, let us try and understand geometrically what is happening here. Okay, so this is my uh, ISO cost curve. So f equals one, f equals two, f equals three, f equals four, and so on. And I pick a point x arbitrarily, x naught, x naught arbitrarily, and let's say my d one is in this direction this is my d1 okay so so now i'm going to consider both the directions plus d1 x0 plus d1 and x0 minus d1 and i want the to figure out the step size alpha k okay i want to figure out the step size alpha k along both these directions where the function f is minimized. So, what is that point? What is the point? <coughs> this is my x naught plus alpha naught d naught. Okay? This is the point because at this point the function is minimized f is equal to 2. If you move away your f becomes equal to 3 here and f becomes equal to 3 here and then f becomes equal to 4 here and f becomes equal to 4 here and so on. Okay. So, that was your first step of the algorithm and in the second step of the algorithm you start moving in the other direction that is this direction d1 and d1 and d0 are q conjugate. So, so that in, in some sense what it means is in this particular space d naught and d 1 would not exactly be orthogonal, but it will be such that it will be, I, so remember orthogonality means d naught transpose d 1 equal to 0, but in this case it is not equal to 0. What is true is d naught transpose q d 1 is equal to 0, right? That is from the definition of q conjugateness, right? So, d 1 has to be in some other direction uh, 
which in some sense minimizes this objective function along some other direction. Okay, and there you will take another step alpha k and you will reach the optimal point. Of course, this is two dimension. So in two steps, you have reached the optimal point, but in higher dimension, you will take multiple such steps and you will optimize the function over some linear manifold. Okay, what is a manifold? Anyone knows what a manifold is? What is a manifold? It's yes, it's a it's a small subset, it's a surface in a very high dimensional space. So that's what a manifold means. So what is this manifold? This manifold looks like a hyperplane in a very high dimensional space. Okay? That's what this manifold MK is. And what, what you are doing is at each point of time or at each point of iteration, you are minimizing the function over this manifold. And at the next time step, you increase the dimension of this manifold I should have taken some arts class. Anyway, <laughs> this, is a, this is some high dimension. The, you have increased the dimension of this manifold at the next time step, and now you are minimizing the function over this manifold. And you keep doing it until you cover the entire space completely. Okay, so sorry, I can't show more than three dimensions on this board. I remember three dimensions is somewhat screwed up. Uh, I should have taken my art classes seriously in my school days, but that, that's gone. Uh, okay. So, any questions about this? This uh, conjugate gradient, uh, con conjugate direction method. You are essentially picking different directions, and you are walking along those directions in order to minimize the function. Every time you pick a different direction, but that different direction is not an arbitrary direction. It has to be a Q conjugate direction. Okay, and so you will converge to the optimal point in at most n steps, okay? But by, uh, let's say if n is equal to 1000, by 900, you're probably very close to optimal already, and so you don't need to uh, worry too much about, if you, if you don't want to find this exact x star, you're fine by stopping at 500 iterations or 600 iterations, you don't have to go all the way to 1000 iterations. Any questions on that? No? I have two more minutes. Someone please ask me a question. <laughs> no questions? Yeah. Good, thank you. Can we do this for like any set of possible directions? Like, you know, yes. Like yes. Uh, this is arbitrary. D0, D1, D2, D4. All of them are completely arbitrary. No, you can't. All this result holds true only if you are using Q conjugate directions. Okay? If you are using linearly independent directions, that may no longer hold. These results will no longer hold. Yeah. It is arbitrary. D naught direction is arbitrary. D1 is not arbitrary because once you have chosen D0, D1 has to be Q conjugate. Okay, so D0 is arbitrary. Okay, you could have chosen you could have chosen this direction as well, right? In which case you would have come to this point, and then the second Q, I mean the D1 in that case would be exactly this point. It will still go through the optimal point. Yeah, then in the first iteration itself, you are done. You don't have to go all the way to n steps. Yeah. Any other question? So Q must be positive semi-definite? Positive definite. Must. Yeah. In, if it is positive semi-definite, it may not be invertible. Uh, it only means it has a unit solution. But if Q is not positive semi-definite, can we also use the conjugate gradient? Uh, mm, not really. How would you find Q conjugate vectors? Remember, in Q conjugate, when you are doing assignment, uh, when you are doing problem number two, you use this property that Q is positive definite. 
if you haven't used this property, you should go back and somehow use it. <laughs> because marks will be deducted if you don't use it. Because it's it's convex, it is strongly convex because Q is positive definite. So it is convex in alpha, strongly convex in alpha. Okay. Do you do you understand that point? So you have a DK chosen already. You pick an alpha, you you now have to pick an alpha K, right? The step size. But because the function f is convex in xk, it will also be convex in alpha. And you will get a unique value of alpha that satisfies this argument condition. OK? All right, thank you, guys. If you have any questions, just come and ask me now. Have a great weekend. <laughs>